Lost is about the cyclical nature of life and time, the way in which everything comes back around. The conflicts of the past echo into the future. People ending up back where they started. The sins of parents impacting upon their children. Things ending, then beginning again. And the island is at the heart of this causality, weaving its tapestry across time, with our lives as the threads that make up its larger picture. One of those key threads is Desmond Hume. He's a unique character in the Lost mythology, as so much of the plot hinges upon specific events related to him and his actions. Without Desmond, so much of the story cannot and would not happen. We have previously discussed how Desmond was guided by both Charles Widmore and Eloise Hawking in his life, both of whom were aware of the importance of Desmond needing to go to the island because of Daniel Faraday's journal entry. But the island itself has been guiding Desmond too, throughout his entire life in both big and small ways. His experiences in the monastery and the army were both to prepare him for his years in the hatch. The monastery taught him how to handle solitude and silence. The army taught him discipline and how to follow orders. His life is being shaped by forces beyond his control and understanding, so that he can save the world on more than one occasion. But perhaps the biggest influence the island has over Desmond comes after he turns the failsafe key. His intense electromagnetic exposure to the source's energy pocket dislodges his consciousness from the flow of linear time. From this exposure, Desmond begins to receive visions from the island. Very specific visions about very specific things. And these visions are the source's way of guiding Desmond along a very specific path in order to keep destiny on schedule. The flashes start the way that they do in order to help Desmond understand how to navigate the visions and to shape events towards the start of the time loop. In other words, getting Ben to push the donkey wheel in 2004. Let's quickly recap the visions that Desmond receives throughout Season 3. He sees a flash of John Locke giving a speech, and tells Hurley, Hurley then tells Charlie that he thinks Desmond can see the future. How did he know she was drowning? I'll tell you how he knew. That guy sees the future, dude. Charlie then witnesses firsthand as Desmond makes some eerie predictions involving lightning and then drowning. This causes Charlie to interrogate Desmond and this is how Charlie discovers that his own destiny is to die. This revelation and several other brushes with near-death predictions prepares Charlie mentally and emotionally to sacrifice himself for the island. Desmond's visions lead him to find and save Naomi, and her survival leads to a plan to contact the freighter. Desmond's visions then lead him to tell Charlie what he needs to do down inside the Looking Glass station. And so Charlie is finally ready to give up his life, as he swims down to the looking glass and unjams the signal. A mission only he could have accomplished, since the passcode was programmed by a musician. This moment was fated to take place. It's why Charlie could not have died at any other point in the timeline. And all of this leads to the freighter's arrival, and a justifiable reason for Benjamin Linus to turn that wheel, and we all know that that wheel is what begins the time loop. Now, if Desmond had not received these flashes of Charlie's death and intervened, then the causal chain of events would not have led to finding Naomi, or the looking glass, or unjamming the signal, or the freighter's arrival, and there would be no motivation to turn that wheel at all. Ergo, no time loop, and that would have created a cataclysmic paradox, because our losties would then not travel back in time to prevent the incident from destroying the world in 1977. And this is why the flashes for Desmond stop after Charlie's death, because the source has achieved what it needed to through him. But there are several lingering questions from this sequence of events. The most prominent one that people tend to ask is this. What happened to Desmond's vision of Claire getting on the helicopter with Aaron? Well, first of all, 
The flashes are debatable as to whether or not they were showing Desmond the actual possible future, or if they were simply visions to motivate him into action. The choices that he has to make. An episode of the Official Lost podcast actually delves into this very idea. I think the question of whether these events are kind of intrinsically a part of fate and destiny or whether they are alterable is a question that the characters are now starting to really wrestle with. You know, what is changeable and how do our interactions cause things to change or just cause a different permutation of the same result? I mean, Desmond tried to save Charlie many times from dying. He didn't get shot with an arrow, but on the other hand, Charlie still drowned in the looking glass station. So was that a was that a, a course of his timeline that he could never alter i think you know that's a it's, a it's a very good question i think the show will be addressing your question with more specificity as we move forward that's why i asked it how much of what desmond is seeing is actually destined to happen and how much of what he is seeing is simply there to lead him to make the choices that he does because he changes the outcomes of multiple visions as a result of having them in the first place if Charlie was truly destined to die whilst trying to save Claire from drowning, or from a random bolt of lightning to the chest, then surely the island would not have given these visions to Desmond so that he could prevent them. Remember, there are no true accidents in Lost. Everything happens for a reason, and everything is flowing towards specific foundational outcomes, even if we don't understand what those reasons are until much later on. Without these visions, the island's tapestry of time cannot be weaved to create the overall picture of our existence, even if you believe that course correction exists within the Lost Universe. Let's throw out a hypothetical. Say Charlie is killed by that lightning strike. Who other than him could have turned off that signal jammer down in the looking glass? How could Jack have made contact with the freighter and allow it to lock onto their position? Even if someone else could have cracked that musical code in the station, the seeds of suspicion about the freighter's intentions are sowed amongst the oceanic survivors because of Charlie's very specific message to Desmond. This message sets the conflicts of Season 4 in motion. Perhaps things could have played out another way if we really tried to come up with an alternative, course-corrected timeline. But things didn't play out differently. They happened this way, exactly as we see with all the right pieces slotting into place like a puzzle coming together to form the picture of Charlie's ultimate fate and how that ripples into conflict with the freighter people and our losties, and how all of this leads to that fateful turn on the wheel of fate itself. Here's another interesting hypothetical for you. In an early scene in Season 3 episode Flashes Before Your Eyes, when Locke tells both Charlie and Hurley in private about Mr. Echo's death, they're in the jungle, far from the beach. That's when Desmond receives a vision of Charlie drowning, trying to save Claire. We see Desmond spring into action to save Claire in the water, and to prevent Charlie from getting there first. Shortly after, Charlie calls after Desmond to ask him, How did you know she was drowning? But this is the bit really worth noting. Let's say Desmond didn't have these visions at all. Claire would have gone for her morning swim, while Locke brought both Hurley and Charlie out into the jungle. So how would Charlie have known that Claire was drowning? We know he's too far away to hear it himself. <laughs> I could hear her calling for help. Oh no, I did. You were like a mile away and we don't see anyone from beach camp rushing towards the group in the jungle to inform them that Claire is in the water and struggling. There is actually no way Charlie would have known to go back to the beach in this small window of time and see Claire drowning, then dive in and save her. Which means, Desmond's vision of Charlie drowning to save Claire was not something that could have happened in those circumstances. All that vision did was prompt Desmond into action, to intercede in what he thought was going to happen. But there is no way it could have happened the way he foresaw it. Without the visions, Claire would have simply drowned, and thus taken away Charlie's primary motivator to give up his own life at the end of the season. So what Desmond is seeing isn't the future, it's a catalyst, 
a catalyst that makes the future happen, just like a dream that Locke has in season one, or the instincts that we see come to Jacob, or even the man in black. The island is showing people and telling them what they need to see or hear, to get them to make choices that need to be made. We are not made privy to the majority of Desmond's flashes, he simply recounts them. The only time we are actually let inside his mind is in the episode Catch-22, in which we see how these flashes look and sound. This is to give us a sense of just how fast the imagery is moving. It's not too dissimilar, actually, to how the smoke monster scans someone's memories. It always comes in flashes. Desmond's final vision involving Charlie's sacrifice and Claire's rescue is also never shown to us, so we don't know exactly what the flashes look like. There are a few possibilities to explain why Desmond's prediction never came to pass. The first is the simplest and most likely option. We know Desmond sometimes misinterprets the flashes in his visions. Only several episodes prior, he thought Naomi was going to be Penny. The events of that whole episode were based upon him misunderstanding the images he was receiving. They come in quick flashes and out of context. He gets a feeling and a vibe of what might happen. It's like only getting pieces of an incomplete puzzle picture. You have to make assumptions as to what the final picture will be. It's also worth noting that he tells Charlie that Charlie would drown in a room after flicking off a switch. You're inside a hatch. It's um, a room full of equipment. It's a blinking yellow light above a switch. You flick the switch. The light goes off. And then you drown. Flick. Drown. Flick. Drown. Flick. Drown. But we know the chain of events between flicking off that switch and Charlie's demise was actually far more complicated than simply flicking a switch and then drowning. In fact, quite a lot happens between the switch being flicked off and his drowning. Again, Desmond is only seeing pieces. However, they still seem to be accurate images. Now, we also know that there was an eventual helicopter escape for the Oceanic Six. That did come to pass. So it's possible that Desmond actually saw a very intense yet brief flash of Aaron being cradled in the arms of a woman on the helicopter, and simply assumed that it was Aaron's mother. Because why wouldn't he? Kate is holding Aaron on the helicopter, and if the image flashed through your mind quickly enough, you might mistake her for Claire. This won't be the last time that Kate becomes a substitute for Claire as a mother either. And look, Claire does eventually fly off the island, only she's on a plane instead of a helicopter, and she's going back to be with Aaron. It might be three years and a lot of pain and suffering later, but Desmond's vision is eventually fulfilled in some way. So it's incredibly feasible that Desmond slightly misinterpreted his flashes, just as we have seen him do previously. I'm sorry. Another plausible explanation is that Claire would have absolutely gotten on the chopper as predicted, but there was a rogue element in the mix, a rogue element who changed the picture's outcome. That element was none other than the man in black. Remember, Claire is on her way back to the Oceanic Beach Camp with Sawyer, and would have been with the group as they got on the helicopter had it not been for the appearance of Christian Shepherd, aka the man in black. He comes to Claire by the campfire and lures her away from her friends, and even convinces her to leave Aaron behind. Had he not interfered and claimed her, the Oceanic Six might well have become the Oceanic Seven. He is the only real reason that she doesn't make it off the island. In recent years, I have seen a more cynical theory emerge as to why Desmond's vision didn't come to pass. There are those that believe that Desmond lied to Charlie about what he saw in his vision, and that he did so in order to unburden himself of having to keep saving Charlie from death. It's a bold theory, 
one that casts Desmond in a very negative light, but there is little to no evidence to support such a reading. Firstly, Desmond never demonstrates nor is alluded to being nefarious in this way. He has demonstrated that he runs away from his problems, but we never see any evidence of him throwing someone under the proverbial bus. Sorry. Or trying to con someone into doing something for his own benefit. This would seem very out of character. The argument goes that Desmond was simply tired of protecting Charlie and wanted to be free of this cosmically unfair situation. However, a key scene undermines this theory completely. In the scene in Greatest Hits, he actively offers to take Charlie's place when they are on the outrigger. You don't have to do this, Charlie. What? I'll go. No, he... he flashes... Maybe I keep seeing you die because I'm supposed to take your place. Now, he wouldn't do that if he is really trying to con Charlie into dying. It is a sincere offer in a sincere scene. The performances and the score, all of it suggests that Desmond is willing to take the plunge instead and to spare Charlie. But regardless of what Desmond did or did not want, this could never be the case. Because it had to be Charlie. It could have only ever been Charlie. The Looking Glass needed a musician to decode a musically programmed keypad. It's also why Mikhail didn't die at the sonar fence line when Locke pushed him into the field, or when he got harpooned in the damn chest. Because Mikhail needed to live long enough to fulfil his side of the destiny equation. We also have to factor in the ambiguous nature of these visions. After all, Desmond has foreseen things that simply could not have come to pass for a variety of reasons. I've already explained this in the context of Charlie drowning trying to save Claire, an event which practically could never have taken place. Which means that Desmond seeing Claire on the helicopter with Aaron might have also been a similar fake-out, an illusion that the island mixed in with fragments of the actual future. We know that Claire could never have left the island back in 2004. How do we know this? Because she is the only reason and motivation for Kate Austen to go back in 2007. If Claire had been rescued, Kate would never have any need to return to the island, and therefore she would not travel back to 1977 to fulfil her part in past events. So, whatever your interpretation is of this final flash that Desmond has, the fact remains that Claire could never have been on the helicopter, as it was not her destiny to escape the island until 2007. The only thing about this flash that truly mattered was that Charlie believed it to be her future. This all leads us to another series of often asked questions about Charlie and his death. Firstly, why is there a discrepancy in Charlie's swimming ability? In season three, Charlie claims, I was junior swim champion in Northern England. I can hold my breath for four minutes, I know exactly what you're talking about, Jack. Yet, all the way back in season one, Charlie declares, I don't swim! I don't swim! Well, we find out that not only can he swim, he can actually swim really well, as evidenced by a flashback that shows his dad teaching him at Butlins, and then we see him swimming just fine beneath the looking glass. You have to remember the context of his character in the early days of the story. I have always looked at his statement as a perfect example of his cowardice. This is happening several episodes before Locke helps him to turn away from heroin in the moth. But he isn't just a drug addict at this point in the story. He's also a self-declared coward. Every track needs a coward. I'm not a coward. He chose not to dive in and swim after the drowning woman in White Rabbit because he didn't want to risk himself or the heroin no doubt stashed in his pocket. Charlie is only just beginning his journey here, a journey that will take him on a full arc, and he has a long way to go before becoming the man that we see in Greatest Hits. 
Now that we know Charlie can swim, let's discuss the questions about his actual demise. Why didn't Charlie just close the door from the other side? Well, this whole slow motion sequence is really taking place within the space of seconds. There isn't a lot of real time to think. But Charlie can see Penny on the monitor and Mikhail at the window with a grenade. Then he sees Desmond rushing towards the open door because Desmond can also see Penny on the monitor, but what Desmond cannot see is Mikhail at the window with an unpinned grenade. There is simply no time to stop and explain. Desmond is determined to get to the woman that he hasn't seen nor spoken to in three years. And Charlie knows that once that window blows open, Desmond's chances of survival will decrease exponentially. Furthermore, this explosion could very well depressurise the moon pool and the whole station. If the door is left open, Desmond will likely be killed along with Charlie. So the door had to be closed so that Desmond would live, so that he could return Charlie's last message to their friends up above. People then ask, well, why couldn't Charlie swim out of the window then? Part of this is to do with perspective. The set seems to have been designed so that the window was too small to practically fit through. Charlie shouldn't be able to fit. But it does look bigger on camera than it probably was intended. Damon Lindelof confirms as much in an interview with Hollywood.com from 2007, in which he says, Once he closed the door to save Desmond, the porthole that Mikhail blew out was too small for him to fit through. But even if this wasn't the case, and the window was much bigger, the moment time slows down again as Charlie watches the water pour in, it finally comes to him. That this is his destiny. This was always the moment that his life was supposed to come to an end. He has to die now, or else Claire and Aaron might never be rescued. Even if he could swim out that porthole and survive, and risk changing the outcome of Desmond's vision, fate still has him marked for death, so he might end up dying some other way for a less noble cause. There will always be another arrow to the neck waiting for him around the corner, at least this way his death means saving the people he has come to love. Death comes to us all eventually. For Charlie, he could either die for nothing or die for something. He chooses to die for something. At least that's what he believes. Meanwhile, Desmond's visions are finally fulfilled in this moment, and they led Charlie to his ultimate destiny. A destiny that started on the day that his father took him out for his first swim, and ended on the day he took his last. The island has accomplished what it needed to through these two men. Because now all the pieces are in place on the board. The freighter. The suspicion. The split between the groups. Ben and Locke together, the Oceanic Six waiting in the wings, the donkey wheel ready to be turned. These two characters have both been labelled as cowards at different points in the series. No hero, brother. I don't know how you're doing what it is you're doing, but I know a coward when I see one. Yeah! <laughs> Perhaps Charlie sees himself in Desmond, and vice versa. Two cowards. But Desmond finally sees something else, and understands that this was not just about predestination, or fulfilling some vision he was given from an unknowable source, but it was also about love. The love that he had for Penny, and the love that Charlie had for Claire. It was about a bond between the two men as well, a bond that they had built together with one another, and a bond that would entwine them together through fate in both life and death. More importantly, this was about choice. Firstly, it was Desmond's choice. To act to give him something that he could not run away from, that no one could run away from, 
destiny itself, making Desmond a conduit between the island and its chosen people, in order to facilitate those choices, and for him to willingly become a bridge between the shameful sins of the past and the redemptive possibilities of the future. And it was also about Charlie's choice too, to become a better man, to sacrifice himself for the greater good, to be the one thing he never thought that he would be, selfless. And this makes the recovering heroin addict and former rock star a real hero for at least the second time in his life. I just did what anyone would do. You are a hero, sir. And don't let anyone ever tell you differently. And so Charlie Pace becomes a worthy namesake for Desmond Hume's future son, because the past is forgiven, and a new future awaits those who are willing to grow and to change. And because everything ends, then begins again. Thank you for watching. Please like, share and subscribe to keep this channel alive. Also consider donating to the Patreon to help me make more videos just like this. Every contribution helps. Until the next time, stay lost.